thank you everyone for being here today. We really appreciate you joining us. It is, uh, it is my distinct honor to be able to introduce the panel and to introduce Tally, who will also be introducing the panel. <laughs> 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 um, Tally is, Tally Burley is the, uh, the senior advisor in MODJ and has been doing some significant work in insurance and, uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing more from, from her in the future. Great, thank you for Hannah, and thank you to the Waterfront Alliance for hosting today's conference. It's yet another good conference this year, and I think I've learned a lot, and I think everyone here has as well. Um, well, who is excited this afternoon to talk about insurance? Um, <laughs> I know that oftentimes people's eyes glaze over when they hear that subject, um, but there's a lot happening in the climate change and insurance space right now. There are a lot of uninsurable uh, issues happening in Florida, Louisiana, and California. Um, but despite all of those challenges, there's some really exciting and innovative work that's happening in the industry. Um, so it is my honor and pleasure to be on this panel today and to serve uh, as moderator. Um, I am joined today by Mac Clark, who is the co-founder of YC-based InsurTech, Clover Parametrics. Clover's mission is to grow the market for new insurance products through software. Before co-founding Clover, Max was an M&A attorney and sold software for the Department of Defense. We're also joined by Jenna Kirkpatrick Howard, who is a senior vice president at Lockton. She works with organizations to identify, assess, and manage their financial, operational, and reputational risks. Jenna has been at Lockton thir for 13 years, where in her role, she leads the Lockton teams in the risk management strategy, insurance program design, risk finance, employee to benefit consulting, claims advocacy, and risk control. Jenna also received the Business Insurance Women, Women to Watch Award in 2023. And finally, Kate Stilwell, who founded Jumpstart, which she continues to lead within, ne lead within Neptune. Jumpstart provides first of its kind parametric insurance for consumers. Kate works to close protection gaps and deploy more private capital towards post-disaster funding. And she's also a licensed structural engineer and the past president of the Structural Engineering Association of Northern California. Well, excited to be with all of you. Um, you know, we should take some time to set the landscape. And so Jenna, do you wanna talk a little bit about the landscape of insurance and climate change and some of the ins uninsurability issues that we're seeing across the country and how that might impact the Northeast? I think you have some slides that sure. you wanna pull up as well. Yeah, I think it's, not on. <coughs> it's working. Is it on? Am I on? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So it does help to set the stage that uh, oftentimes people want to talk about the rising insurance rates and what it looks like year over year. So setting the stage, if you look back at the insurance industry in decades, if you look from the 80s to 2000, we were seeing about $24 billion annually in sort of an average insurer losses in a year. Well, it basically doubled when you hit 2012 to 2021. And then so far in our 2020s, we're averaging 76 billion. So we're almost seeing a doubling. And you're seeing single events um, be much, much larger than they've ever been for a couple reasons. Yes, climate change. We're also putting more construction values in vulnerable <coughs> locations. We're also putting more, more people and the cost of construction is rising. So you've got, you've got several dynamics that are increasing these. I think what's really interesting when you wanna specifically talk about climate events, we spend a lot of time in the insurance industry talking about earthquakes and talking about hurricanes and talking about flooding, all of which are very important and play a very dynamic role when it comes to insured losses. But if you look at this one, what we call secondary perils, so strong storms, freezes, winter storms, droughts, uh, wildfires, these, sing these secondary peril losses are accounting for an increasing number of insurable losses. So when we talk about CAD, catastrophic in the insurance language, we're not we're no longer just talking about big hurricane losses or a major earthquake. It is the severe storm that is driving up the insurance costs, hail storms, wind. And, and so from an insurance perspective, 
this has caused, in particular, the last few years to see very sharp increases in property insurance rates and insurers pulling out of property. Because when you're, when you're an insurance company and you have all these different lines of insurance, you have property, you have cyber, you have liability, and property stops performing profitably, they pull back and say, I'm, I want to write less premium. I'm going to offer less limits. And I'm going to put that investment into <coughs> workers' compensation and my other things that seem perform better and maybe are more stable. So we saw the insurance marketplace contract in the traditional property insurance marketplace. And I will say over 2024, our first two quarters, rates are stabilizing at the higher level. So when we talk to clients, uh, large real estate owners or large property owners and say, you saw a 50% increase one year and a 30% last year, and it's stable this year. Like, well, thanks. It's stable at a really high number, but at least it's not 30%. <coughs> Everyone's talking about what is this wind season going to look like because uh, there is the prediction that we're going to have a very active wind season this summer. And so these softening markets, the stabilization of the property market that we've seen in the first two quarters will potentially stop and go back to a harder market if we have a very tough wind season. Um, and, and so putting aside, there could be the severe storms that we're talking about and earthquake and wildfire, the wind season could very much dramatically change where we're at where we finally see stabilization. So you asked specifically about parts of the country that are insurable. Florida gets all of the attention because Florida has not only climate change impact, we have put an immense amount of construction value into Florida on, our, on the coastline. And they have an interesting litigation environment that I won't get into in the, the context of this. So for many, many reasons, the citizens, which is their state fund, um, has been really, really challenged. The insurance marketplace has not been particularly profitable. So we saw large insurers pulling out. We are starting to see some insurers go back in. But it means if you're a real estate developer, a community organization, or any client that has property in Florida, you've got to get creative about how to insure it. You've got to go back to lenders and ask about changing deductible structures, reducing limits, taking more risk onto your balance sheet, or look at alternative risk products, which I think we're going to get into with others on the panel. We are, and thank you for that. Max, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what you've started to see in New York and the New York region within this landscape? Yeah, um, I think that's a good question, particularly because you mentioned a lot of the states that I would call sort of ground zero for some of these issues. We're talking about California with wildfire or the Gulf for wind or Texas for freeze, et cetera. But because of the interconnectedness of a lot of the insurance ecosystem, the impacts in those property markets impact risks far outside of those regions, including like in New York. And so what we've seen broadly is that, you know, even for buyers for whom the risk really hasn't changed a great deal, you're still seeing significant increases in prices, um, which make it very hard to get the coverage that you need to satisfy things like lender requirements. Um, and so particularly in New York, I think a prevailing concern is both, well, I'll say name storm, but less so for wind and more so strictly for flood. Um, the memory of something like Sandy, I think particularly in the battery, like literally right here, um, rings very, like, true and sort of still recent. And so um, part of what you do see is, I think, a growing number of markets offering alternative products that are available even when admitted markets pull back. Um, we can talk a little bit more about what some of those are like. So there, there are tools out there to help the industry respond um, to some of these kind of interconnected and more complicated ways that you know a wildfire in Northern California could make it harder to get flood insurance in New York. Thank you for that. And I do think that uh, underscoring some of the affordability challenges for the people on the ground as these prices are going up is a big thing that we're seeing in New York at the municipal level and at the community level. We have a lot more people who can no longer afford insurance of any kind, and they have very few options in a really tight housing market of where else they can go. And so balancing those increasing insurance costs with their home costs is a, is a pretty difficult thing. Well, now that we've set the landscape a little bit, um, Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about how the insurance industry can proactively innovate within this space and address some of these emerging risks and build resilience? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the factors uh, affecting climate risk, uh, insurability of climate risk in particular is the, let's call it the uncapped uncertainty. There's so much we don't know. There are these unknown unknowns when we uh, model out what the potential losses could be. And so um, one way to hedge against that is to limit the downside that insurers face. And that means creating a different sort of insurance policy or maybe an adjustment or an alternative type of insurance policy where there is a um, maximum limit that uh, is going to be paid out. And so one of the um, – uh, th so that gets into the type of insurance that I founded, but I, I want to explain a little bit about my background professionally because it gives some context into why I did this. And it's, this is not the Kate show, but um, it gives a little bit of context. So I'm a licensed structural engineer, and as the president of the association, I participated in public policy uh, committees that addressed resilience and the kinds of um, resilience metrics that were talked about in the previous panel. Um, and, 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 uh, and not just the infrastructure-related resilience, but all of the things – so now this goes back 15 years ago – but all the things that ha now have come to bear on this conference and all of the social and economic factors and realizing that there's this big gap in having enough, let's call it, um, climate – what we would now call, call climate financing, but at the time, like how much – economic stimulus is coming in after a natural disaster. So I was motivated to help fill this gap, and I stumbled upon the notion of parametric insurance. And at the time, it was being used for um, only at, like, large corporate levels. So parametric means that a pre-agreed lump sum of money – at the time, it was, like, $100 million um, – would be dispersed upon occurrence of a predetermined parameter, which is why it's called parametric. Uh, and then it's completely without any arbitration. It's just a contract of this money gets dispersed at this period of time. So it works a little bit like a, a swap, if you're familiar with that kind of financial instrument. And I was like, okay, well, well, why don't we have this for individuals for earthquake risk in California and flood risk in New York and all of this? And so um, I uh, jumpstart created parametric insurance for consumers, which this this lump sum of uh, we started with just ten thousand dollars to be dispersed at the time of the next major earthquake. Um, and it's not enough to rebuild your house, just enough to get a jump start on the recovery process, which is why we called it jump start. But this notion – and so we built it, we sell it, um, and within Neptune we're working on how do we expand this notion to flood insurance and get more people covered. And it's not just – we don't have to sell it onesie twosie, and this is not a, a commercial for Jumpstart either, but thinking about what are these alternative mechanisms and, um, you know, there could be ways to help the um, folks who are exposed to flood risk, even if they don't buy insurance on a onesie twosie basis, get parametric payouts with these capped – down, this capped downside, so the insurer knows and can price appropriately what is the cost of that risk, and then it's more um, budget friendly, let's call it, but also provides um, uh, discretionary funds to people to use to, for however they need to recover, even if their home is not damaged, and that therefore it lets the insurance serve the role as economic stimulus after a disaster. Um, those are all really great ideas. I mean, I think parametric is sort of the buzzword in the insurance space right now, especially as it relates to climate and climate insurance. Um, but Max, uh, maybe from your experience on the regulatory side, what are the types of regulatory reforms that we need to help make some of those things come into fruition? Yeah, for sure. can definitely talk about that. Um, maybe to briefly I, – I like the question that you asked before is, like, what can the insurance industry do proactively? I feel like particularly looking at the slide you put up, like, we're kind of, like, past proactive, honestly, at this point. It's <laughs> like, what can they do post-active? I don't know if that's a word, but I'll say it, that word. Um, and I think, like, it's remarkable because there are these, like, insane losses, and the industry is, I think, for reasons that are both, like, systemic to the industry but also, like, regulatory in nature, frankly doesn't have that many great tools to respond. Like, we've probably seen – Many people from this room have probably read that in California, like State Farm, all state farmers have made like very draconian business d decisions to leave the state entirely, at least until the state changes how it allows those insurance companies to price something like wildfire risk. Um, and it's kind of like crazy that those companies have like such a limited set of tools and choices, right? They can either leave a market entirely or stay in a market and lose money. And so like that, that problem is both it's both commercial in terms of climate risk, but it's also like regulatory. And so like a lot of times these issues are like overlapping um, in ways that make them like challenging to resolve, but it's not just climate or just regulatory in any event. I just want to say that. But 
Yeah. Wait, 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 before you, um, I'm sorry for jumping no, in here, but it. related to California wildfire, being a Californian myself, um, there, and there's something really important that mit some people in this room might not realize, which is that um, regulators, for very good historical reasons related to social equity, um, prohibit insurers from setting insurance premiums, the prices that you pay, based on forward-looking models of, of losses. They only, they require insurers to base their premiums only on backward-looking historical losses. Mm -hmm. So for climate-related risks like wildfire, like flood, this is a, a very severe limitation on the part of insurance companies, and it means that they're underpricing their risk systematically, which means that they don't have the lever, th then their only options are to leave the market or to, um, well, leave the market because they can't charge higher rates. And so one of the negotiating pieces that um, the insurers have tried to work with the California regulators for wildfire is to use forward-looking climate, climate models for pricing wildfire risk. Um, and that's a, um, that's a negotiation that looks like it's going to, they're going to meet and have some middle ground. But um, there are some very good reasons why insurance companies would not want, uh, sorry, the insurance regulators would not want companies using hypothetical models uh, of risk. And just to maybe pause before <coughs> Max jumps back in, I think because not everyone in this room is probably an insurance expert, but insurance is regulated at the state level. So every state that you go to, the insurance industry, the regulations look a little bit different because each state is regulated independently. Um, and so that makes some of these conversations sort of tricky. So one thing that's happening in California might not necessarily be possible in New York or Florida or Utah. And so that it sort of looks at both a more progressive insurance regulator versus a conservative regulator taking very different approaches to what is and isn't possible within the market. And I would I take that one <laughs> step further. <laughs> Insurance is regulated on a state level, but so is case law. So when you uh -huh. look at how things are pushed through the court system and, and when you're looking at liability cases and how things are um, arbitrated, it, it, everything matters when you're looking at the regulations, the insurance marketplace, and then on the on the claim side, because there are certain jurisdictions where you look at it and you're like, why does anyone dislike Illinois? It, it, mm -hmm. You know, it's in the middle of the country. They don't have quite the catastrophic exposure. Well, legislatively, it's a really challenging marketplace to do to do business for insurance carriers. So there's so many factors that go into why and where insurance can be placed profitably. Max, do you have anything more? Yeah. <laughs> we jumped in a couple of times on you. All right. <laughs> it's good. Um, to kind of apply some of that, sorry, I'm going to jump all the way ahead. Okay, so like, I think in general, specifically for parametric insurance, Kate, you were kind of introducing it before. For those that aren't familiar, it's one type of alternative risk product that has existed for a long time. It's not new. It's been around for like 35 years. Never been terribly widely adopted. I like to say that the original parametric insurance was just life insurance, where there's like one parameter. It's like, are you alive? Mm -hmm. If you're not alive, you get a payment. So it's basically taking that, like if this, then that, and applying it, that model of risk transfer, usually to property. And so in the context of a, of a hurricane, right, you might say the worse a storm is in terms of the, um, you know, the category of storm and the closer a storm is to your location, your business, the more you'd get paid. So these products have, I think, been, been challenged by some of the regulatory issues that everybody just flagged. Um, were that to change, I would say there needs to be at least – four things happen, and this is, you know, I think you might feel depressed at the end of this, um, <laughs> given how large these things are. But at the federal level, the CFTC, to your point about the uh, point that Kate made, sometimes in different contexts, these products can look more like swaps, um, which are regulated by a different entity. So there should be some kind of affirmative statement that that entity is not regulating these products as swaps, but in fact, they are considered insurance and subject to the insurance safe harbor. Similarly with the IRS, you know, lots of ambiguity, frankly, around um, whether the proceeds from some of these products are taxable or not. I would argue that is easily remediable with a statement that just like normal insurance products, these are going to be deductible in the form of the premiums you pay and tax exempt in the form of the proceeds that you get from any policy. Um, the state level, I think someone already brought this up, there is no federal law of insurance. So yes, every state has to expand their definition of insurance and what it does, um, as well as I think lender acceptance. So whenever, you know, oftentimes, insurance is a forced purchase. People buy it because someone is forcing them to buy it. Um, and if that person, usually a lender, um, is willing to expand their, their definition of what kind of product will satisfy their covenants and reps and warranties, I think you'll see wider adoption too. So some of these are within, with, within an insurance company do, many of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, 
And I know, you know, from our experience here in New York City working on parametric insurance, one of the challenges that we had was that not having a definition of parametric in the regulation basically was taken to be akin to gambling. And so it really does matter having those that language in the law to make something possible. Um, so jumping up to some specific case studies, Kate, do you want to talk a little bit about how insurers can collaborate with policymakers, communities, businesses, and others um, within this space um, and ensure both resilience and affordable coverage, especially in some of the most vulnerable areas? Yeah, and that's like such a loaded question <laughs> that I'm going to start with a story that is really your story to tell. <laughs> and so I'm really just teeing up Tally to, just, to, just, to give it back to her. Um, but there's this uh, outstanding um, case study that was done here in New York that was spearheaded by the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, um, where there was a philanthropic gift who, the source of which I don't remember, but Tally will fill you in, um, that paid for a parametric insurance policy that uh, ended up not um, being considered insurance. But nevertheless, it worked as insurance, and um, the beneficiaries were the stakeholders of the Center for New York City Neighborhood. So, so for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know uh, a year ago who this was, um, they are an, an NGO here in the city focused on um, low and moderate income families, homeowners, specifically homeowners, many of whom the, uh, their home is inherited and the primary source of their generational wealth. Um, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And the, recognizing that the best housing policy is to keep people in the homes that they already own and to prevent people's generational wealth from being wiped out in just one flood. So the idea is, okay, so we use this X dollar amount from this philanthropist and leverage it to pay for these deeper pockets from insurance, and then when a big flood happens, as defined by a parameter, then the center can disperse as grant money to all of its beneficiaries, all of its homeowners, these $4,000 to up to $10,000 grants for them to be able to recover from the flood, even if they didn't have damage, recognizing that the flood is going to cause these incidental expenses and disruption that could set them back in terms of their monthly expenses and not wanting to initiate this spiral of debt. So that's a really fantastic case study. One of the things that I think, going back to like what needs to change from a regulatory perspective, I'm jumpi jumping ahead here, and I'm sorry for okay. um, butting in, is if that um, case study was able to negotiate a multi-year contract rather than a one-year contract, then there would have been a lot more leverage on the part of the Center for New York City Neighborhoods to be able to continue providing benefits as opposed to having to renegotiate with the insurance company every single year and being subject to some of these inflationary pressures. So multi-year contracts is, again, possibly part of the solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can talk a little bit more about that case study mm -hmm. that, that Kate just mentioned. It was uh, funded through the National Science Foundation through a Civic Innovation Challenge. Um, it was the first type of uh, grant funding that they had done of this kind. Um, and we did it in collaboration with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which is a local nonprofit, as Kate mentioned. Uh, Carolyn Kuski, who was at Wharton, the Wharton Risk Center at the time, Helen Wiley, who's now at SVP, um, and ultimately private sector insurers and insurance brokers all coming together to think about how could we create something that could address the post-disaster financial needs of low and moderate income households in the city. Um, and what we had seen after Hurricane Sandy is that there were these incidental costs. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that people had coverage in the immediate days after a disaster because financial disaster assistance, flood insurance through the NFIP takes months, if not years, mm -hmm. and that's just not enough time for somebody who doesn't have savings or resources that they can tap into. So the examples that I typically use is like, if your kitchen doesn't work, you have to eat out every night. That is something that is not covered by insurance or financial disaster assistance. And so how do we get money into ha people's hands faster? And that's really where Parametric came into the conversation. We explored lots of different types of innovative insurance and uh, funding and financing. Parametric was exciting to us because it can be fast and flexible because it is pre-contracted and it doesn't require a claims process in the same way as traditional insurance. What made the collaboration between all of us really, I think, valuable to the conversation is it's very rare to have public, private, and nonprofit partners all at a single table having a conversation and working towards the same goals. 
And it opened the doors to a lot of different possibilities. It created a lot of transparency between the private and the public sector about our roles and what is and isn't possible, and different skill sets that I don't think all of us even knew existed within the different industries. Uh, I, for one, didn't know until I started doing this work that there are hydrologic modelers within the insurance industry who could play a role in helping us understand how to better model risk. Um, and so that, for us, I think is a really exciting uh, example and case study. We haven't actually triggered this policy. We don't know if it's doing everything that we want it to do yet, um, but we're hoping that it can be a good example moving forward. So that's one, one case study, Kate. I don't know if you have others in some of your work across the country that you might want to point to. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to hog the mic. I'm just going to say um, that's, a pr that's a great starting point to be able to think about how your organizations, uh, whether it's a public entity, an NGO, a private employer, um, can act as a um, a, an organizing entity for be able to uh, provide immediate and non-arbitrated benefits um, through using private market sources uh, in the case of a, a you know an extreme triggered event. I think we have and there's lots of panelists here yeah. who would love to help you do that. Yeah. I'd add too, if it's all right, um, on the case study question, um, like we're, we're seeing a lot of the same kind of thing. So like one example, we are currently working with a buyer in the New York City area. Um, it's a large industrial client. Mm -hmm. During Sandy, this buyer had a huge business interruption loss. They had NFIP, um, but for various reasons, um, NFIP d doesn't mm -hmm. always cover everything that ha happened certainly in the aftermath of some kind of catastrophic flooding event like that. And so we were able to go and price some of these flood parametric products that are available on the market, help that buyer make a determination as to what at what price they wanted to basically trade that against that that risk and buy the buy the insurance product. And they got were able to get multi million dollar coverage that they didn't have a year before. So these these products are out there and do exist, um, and hopefully they will continue to become more widely adopted and available. I think as we see more case studies emerge, what we are seeing is communities and governments and the sector starting to work together uh, much more frequently and having consistent conversations with each other about what's happening on the ground. Um, so we have one last panel question, and then I think we have, we'll have we probably have about uh, 12 to 10 minutes or so for you guys to ask all of your questions, so be getting ready to raise your hands. Uh, Jenna, I think this last one is for you, uh, at least to start us off. What successful initiatives has the insurance industry already undertaken to mitigate climate risks, and how can those be scaled and replicated? So, climate risk has been on the radar of insurance carriers for decades and decades. This isn't this isn't new. Um, what is newer? The research has been there. the The speed in which they're changing models mm -hmm. has been there. We're just now starting to see the larger property insurers like FM Global, which is actually a risk engineering, but also the largest property um, insurer in the world, and, and Zurich, and I'm going to highlight those two specifically because they have climate risk assessments available to their clients. They have done research and they offer credits to their insurers that are really taking on resiliency measures. For example, I have a client that um, went underwent an immense amount of work to uh, on their locations and they received I guess they spend upwards of 20 million dollars on insurance every year in property insurance and they receive a 10 percent resiliency credit just for taking on measures to make their buildings um, more sustainable and really look at the changing flood and stormwater um, that was going to impact them as well as their curtain wall so the insurance industry Yes, has been researching, but is now taking a little more of a proactive step in getting involved in climate change assessments and offering credits to those clients that are really doing the right things. Yeah, similar to that, um, I'm aware of uh, um, to wineries in Napa, Sonoma Valley. Um, have not been able to get insurance since basically 2020, and some of some of them not since 2017 because there was a series of fires from 17 to 2020, um, and insurers did not want to touch those properties. There is, um, and so I was up at a um, visiting the wildfire defense of a winery this past Sunday, two days ago. Um, so a, a winery that has installed a giant, an 80 million gallon tank. Maybe I'm not, maybe it's 80,000 gallon tank. Can't be 80 million. 80,000 gallon water tank reservoir for their firefighting purposes, and a super highly pressurized uh, sprinkler system on the roof of all of their buildings to be able to put out wildfire, not just on the building but in the surrounding um, vines as well. 
Um, and uh, there is an insurer who's now um, ready to come back into the market and offer insurance to these wineries um, at a baseline price. And then if they comply with certain um, adaptive climate adaptive measures to protect against wildfire, then they will offer discounts of up to 25 percent, but the standard discount is 10 percent. So again, incentivizing these mitigative measures, but this is at the relatively high policy value level. And so the, the holy grail is going to be what we talked about in the panel this morning, is how do we um, incentivize the adaptive measures at this micro level, at the property by property basis. And I think that that is in the foreseeable future of being able to incorporate mitigation and adaptation measures on a property by property basis, not just for the high value property. So that's, you know, five years from now, I think our industry might be um, a small pat on the back. There's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of things not on the pat on the back, but that might be a, a good one. Anything else anyone wants to add? Otherwise, we're ahead of schedule, <laughs> shocking, uh, and probably just scratched the surface um, on what we could have probably talked about for hours. Um, so why don't we open up for all of you to ask some questions. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> Go for it. Hey, folks. Julian McCrown here but, um, for spending a lot of time thinking about the uh, you know, risks that households and communities face from these uh, various affordability crises that we face. I know that insurance is a really big part of the equation. Um, I think first would I just underline that the cross-subsidy question is really interesting, and if folks want to learn more about it, would plug some research that Ali Gulares at the Board of Governors in Washington have done that showed that there's a lot of interesting work in exposed states versus, um, or regulated versus less regulated exposed states, but where some of the really interesting action has happened is in non-exposed states that have more strict insurance regulations than not strict ones. And the not strict ones are actually cross-subsidizing a substantial part of the insurance increase exposed states. Um, so just, just something to, to potentially look into there. And then wondering if anybody's thinking about different ways that insurers can contribute to resiliency on the asset, using the asset side of their balance sheet. So um, you know these are big investment funds with capital to deploy and um, could be playing more proactive roles um, in building household and community resilience with their own balance sheet investments. So curious, uh, apart from policy and the liability side, where, where do you think the opportunities might be there? I'll, I'll talk just briefly on the real estate side. So I think <coughs> I'm tracking with your question, and, and that there, outside of the insurance, there's an investment income part of, of the insurance carriers, and most of them do have real estate investment funds. And some of them have a climate-focused, micro sort of finance focus. There's not enough of it, but and what I mean by that is they are, a, as an institutional investor, will look at real estate developers and real estate owners to put money into as an investment portfolio return, right? So instead of going to the stock market, they go to a, to a real estate um, and, and, and act as a fund for real estate. And they are starting to see, I'll, I'll credit AIG in this way, that they have put forth some very strict uh, parameters around the type of real estate they'll invest in is there um, a DEI focus? Is there a women-owned, minority-owned? Where are the development opportunities? Are they staying away from places they wouldn't write insurance? If they won't write in, in a certain geography, why would they own real estate and invest in that geography? So marrying both sides of the house in a very large insurance carrier environment, those two sides of the house don't talk very often. Uh, so oftentimes they won't necessarily take the same stance on what is insurable <coughs> and then what is a good investment opportunity. I think there is probably an opportunity to better marry those objectives. Yeah. Thank you, great in information. Two specific kinds of insurance. That uh, one is homeowner flood insurance. There are people from FEMA to here today, and the second is environmental insurance. And with more to do with contamination than with, but um, for example, in Katrina, what happens when a contaminated site gets flooded? 
But anyway, in those two particular types of insurance, what you see happening in the market. I, I can talk a little about the flood insurance okay. piece of this, at least from the NFIP lens, and then I'll sure. pass it off from the, the environmental side. So NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, which is traditional homeowners flood insurance policies, there are supplemental complemental policies you can get, but the vast majority of those policies are actually sold through the federal government, through FEMA. Um, and it's regulated in a completely different way. So <laughs> unlike uh, all of the insurance that we just talked about that's largely regulated at the state level, NFIP is regulated at the federal level. And so we're not actually seeing the same changes and the same innovation in that space because there ne there's this large need for reform to the NFIP and that requires congressional authorization. Um, and so for, in order for FEMA to get really creative in some of the things that they're doing, you actually need Congress to act and make changes to to that program. What they have done is begin to change the way that they price flood insurance policies across the country so that instead of looking at just a map and saying you're in a flood zone or you're out, now uh, every single policy is priced based on the individual structure and the risk to that structure, looking at a variety of different things. That is good in concept. I think from a, a government perspective, from a community perspective, the concern is that now those prices are going up and people don't necessarily have the ability to afford those policies and maybe dropping their coverage. Um, but it's a little bit different than some of these other insurance policies. I'll, I'll touch on environmental insurance. It, it has a lot of conversation around it for um, a, a, a several different beyond just mold, but Legionnaires and, and PFAS. There's a whole host of uh, things going on in the environmental insurance market, but surprisingly, it's a very soft market. It's actually one of the more competitive lines of insurance that we're seeing in the overall portfolios um, because not every insurer buys environmental that, we're, that we are seeing um, the risk transfer. It, it's not typically required, so you have buyers of environmental that are very focused on um, the right things to do in environmental. Homeowners is the exact opposite story. Um, the homeowner's insurance environment is actually the hardest it's ever been in the insurance marketplace. If you take the property insurance market that saw massive increases over the last two years, the homeowners had an even more sharp increase of insurers pulling out of certain markets altogether. California, you had already talked about Florida's experience in that, so is Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, and mark and insurers are not apt to go back in. And the homeowners insurance marketplace already had less insurers in it than a commercial insurance environment. So now we've we've made that market even smaller, which means the rates for homeowners unfortunately are going up and the uninsurable crisis <coughs> in Florida is ma mainly a homeowner's issue, not necessarily commercial. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off of um, Jenna's comments about going back to the very first question we addressed in the panel. Um, you know, the, a crisis of uninsurability is not new. So we've seen this not necessarily in homeowners, except possibly after the um, 1994 earthquake in California, but in um, related to workers' compensation insurance, related to product liability and asbestos insurance. Um, and after each of these, and just in the last few decades, after each of these crises, there is a predictable set of consequences, which we can probably expect after this uh, crisis of homeowners, property insurance on availability, and that includes um, uh, limitations on the amount of and type of coverage, so limiting the coverage availability um, so that the insurers don't have unlimited downside, um, permanently higher prices, um, having a, uh, in many cases, a central organizing entity uh, like for the earthquake example, California Earthquake Authority, have some collective bargaining power uh, to be able to regulate and stabilize rates, but also, in order for that to work, having the, um, the, the o if having participating insurance companies as a condition of being able, the private market insurers, having to take, put some skin in the game and be responsible for paying out some of the most extreme disaster losses. And then finally, lender acceptance by the lenders of these um, limited types of products. So those are the five outcomes that I think are um, as what we can expect to see. And the one that's going to hit the bottom line, the front, and we have to think about it from an equity lens, is the permanently higher prices and how do we cross-subsidize uh, some of those in a fair way. But it's not unprecedented. Question in the back. Um, I have 
two questions and I think they're related. So the parametric insurance seems like a, a good thing because it actually lowers costs to the people affected by the disaster and it lo lowers the administrative cost of insurance, so good thing. But it can't replace a regular homeowner policy or whatever, so I'm kind of wondering what's in that context, what's happening with the homeowner policy. I mean, it's nice to get $10,000 or whatever immediately and it does re reduce your cost of dealing, but if you need to do major work on your house, you still have to pay for it. So that's one question. And the other one that I think is related is to what extent is it appropriate to use higher insurance costs as a way to prevent people from rebuilding in neighborhoods that where they're gonna keep getting hit, you know, where the probability of harm is very high. Um, and obviously that ties into, you know, the, the um, intergenerational wealth issues, especially with the people who are no longer paying a mortgage, so their mortgage can't control, you know, tie into their insurance. Nobody can require them to get insurance because they don't have a mortgage lender saying you must have insurance, so they don't insure because they can't afford it, but that's all their wealth. But I'm kind of wondering, you know, how do you, to what extent do we want the insurance market to keep people from building uh, vulnerable structures? Yeah, I think you're right on the first piece. Um, like parametric insurance in particular isn't best thought of as a replacement, certainly. Um, I think it's best thought of as like a, a complement. Um, and so to apply the example to homeowners, right, we've talked about the rising deductibles or increasing deductibles where an individual has to basically take more of the risk onto their own balance sheet, so to speak. In that context, a parametric insurance product might serve as a deductible buyback. So your deductible might go up to 10%, but then you can have a parametric for the 10% of the value of your home, such that if there's a big storm or if there's a big event, you are likely to be covered up to the point at which your traditional insurance policy would begin to kind of kick in. And so there's ways that these can kind of like interact with each other. Um, on the second piece, I think that's like a, a, a very important question. Um, and ultimately, I think like there's a question of to what extent should America, I guess, be like socializing climate risk. And the, what the de facto incumbent solution that we currently have is basically one where in some sense, like, and I'll use Florida as an example, just because we are going into wind season and everyone's expecting a massive one, um, right? There's Citizens, which is the Florida runs, the taxpayer backed insurance company of last resort. So to, to some extent, when Citizens kicks in and everyone floods into Citizens, you're socializing those coastal losses to the Florida taxpayer. And then when there's a really big storm, FEMA kicks in. Um, and you're socializing it to the American taxpayer. And so basically what we're doing is like America, we are all, the American taxpayer is subsidizing like coastal Florida real estate. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, that's above my pay grade. Um, but that is effectively what we are doing and kind of like the choice that we've made by default. Um, so just some, some thoughts in response to your, to your question. I think there is the, the concept of insurance is to replace with like kind and quality to your point. Do we even need to rebuild? in that location, the insurance marketplace has not and has not been able to, and I likely regulatory could not tell someone, we won't look build with like kind and quality here, but if you go four miles inland, we would. Um, and I think that will need to come to your point, socialization and regulatory. We can no longer build in that particular area. Uh, it, you were maybe grandfathered in, but the, that next storm pushes you four miles in. But I don't think the insurance contract itself has that ability. Right, and also um, for consumer protection, insurance is regulated. For consumers, and uh, for consumer insurance is regulated, and the prices in particular are regulated. And so, if you're an insurance regulator, and the insurance um, companies say, "Well, we're going to have um, you know a hundred, a thousand dollars a year for everybody in your state, except for this little band here. Everybody's going to co cost ten thousand dollars." That doesn't, I mean, you're a politician. When you're the insurance commissioner, you're a politician. So um, it's not a total free market. Uh, you don't have all the levers of a free market, um, free market when you're an insurer. But I would be remiss if I didn't take the, um, uh, the opportunity to pitch an idea related to your first question about, okay, what hap how does parametric or other alternatives complement the existing insurance infrastructure? As property insurance you know, cuts back more and more coverage, how can alternative structures um, fill the gaps? What if, like health savings accounts, at the federal level, you know, this goes back to what needs to change. What if there was, and it also goes back to the congressional authorization of MFIP, what if at the federal level there was tax, um, 
credits for disaster savings accounts, right? Okay, so an individual contributes to their disaster savings account. Let's say that, you know, like flood, like earthquake, now wildfire and other climate risks are going to get excluded from your property insurance. Um, and so you can use your disaster savings account to pay for expenses related to climate risks. Oh, but what yeah. if the employer also does a matching contribution? And oh, what if the um, federal uh, FEMA also provides a matching contribution? And what if part of the matching contribution goes to buy a parametric policy, suddenly your $1,000 a year that you're pitching into your disaster savings account, if there's a, a big enough disaster, maybe federally declared or maybe triggered by one of these extreme parameters, then leverages and multiplies to instead of $1,000 a year, $10,000 a year because of the leverage effect of these parametric policies. Suddenly, people would have from the private market funding using this leverage effect a lot more money to be able to recover and, and effectively disaster stimulus to be able to pay for their expenses after the next um, natural disaster. So next time you're in with your uh, uh, congressional representative, pitch the idea of tax advantage disaster savings accounts like tax advantage health aid savings accounts. clear <laughs> signal in the <laughs> corner. Uh, I think we, we're out of time for questions, um, but we're up here for a couple more minutes if you want to come up and ask us separately. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we really enjoyed this. I think it was a great discussion. <laughs> of course, Sarah. <laughs> resources for like the one-on-one -on, -one on just the ground floor of, ta of understanding this conversation better. I feel like this has been super enlightening, but it's kind of up here and I need to start <laughs> at kindergarten. You guys were in ninth grade, so, <laughs> so if there's, not to suggest you aren't obviously much higher than ninth grade, but you know what I mean. Um, so if there's just some way to kind of, some basic Googling we could, I just feel like there's so much that is, is compelling for those of us who are in kind of adjacent parts of the greater kind of climate conversation. So. So I'm going to suggest, uh, at least for me, and others can, can weigh in too, there's some really great literature by Carolyn Kuski, who's now at EDF, that talks about all of this in very plain language. She can talk about insurance in a way that, as a kindergartner, they would probably walk away going, I get it. So she is the person. And her book is called book. Understanding Disaster Insurance. You'll even be able to remember it. Mm -hmm. Understanding mm -hmm. Disaster Insurance by Carolyn Kuski. Absolutely, the number one primer. Well, thank you everyone for joining today and let's give a final round of applause to the panel who are so amazing. Thank you all for being here.